So a second example here when it comes to memory system performance is, you know, the thing I've been alluding to here is I'm, all I'm doing in these two functions, copy ij and copy ji, is copying data from point A to point B. So I have a giant a structure, a two-dimensional structure of data, 11,500 elements in each direction, which accounts for 132 million plus elements, uh, all int size. So multiply that by four even. So it's, we're moving 500 megabytes of, of you know, storage from point A to point B. Uh, and the only difference is this, these for loops is the way, in this one I'm doing I first, and then the J when it comes to how I'm you know, figuring out my I, J's that I'm trying to copy. And in the other case, I've just reversed the J's with the I's and the I's with the J's when it comes to the order of operations. And you go, that's no big deal. That should work exactly the same amount of speed. But let's see what happens when we try to run it. So what you see here in this case is something that was a few milliseconds to move in one case turned into a huge chug on the other. And then I'll leave the question for you, like, what was the difference? What makes one so much faster than the other? So there's a few more odds and ends we need to take a look at before we can call it a day here. So something to take note of is the, you know, that a computer itself you know, the function of a pure computer has modified, has been changed over the years. So back, back, oh my goodness, 20 years ago when I was going through my undergrad, you know, there was no real networking. You know, it was a big deal that the computer, they could get a network card and I could put it into my computer and I could actually access the school's computer system from my dorm room. That was a big deal. Nowadays, that's as yawny as you get, right? And then I'm telling my old man stories as I'm screaming at a cloud, right? So, like... But today, especially nowadays, data, data movement from point A to point B, from my computer to your computer, client, server, architecture, I mean, that's what everything is. Web page this, web page that. And so network communication is essential to the proper functioning of a computer in this, this day and age. And that's, that's something to understand. We're not going to cover anything regarding communication, especially in assembly language. We're not going to worry about it. All we're going to move data from maybe to a file, you know, but nothing when it comes to communicating over the internet or over some, some wire from point A to point B. So now I'm presuming that you guys have a general fundamental understanding of computer science and a general fundamental understanding of at least one to three or four different types of programming languages. You don't have to be experts by any means, but Python, C, C++, Java, C Sharp, uh, you know, those kind of programming languages, you know, like as you'll see as you get more and more experience that many of the languages are pretty much similar because the computer can only do the operations, multi add, subtract, multiply, divide, copy from point A to point B, and you know, only these kind of things. So it makes sense that computer languages basically end up doing the same kind of operations. So higher level languages like Python have a ton of libraries under the hood that can do a lot of the complicated statistical analysis and other things that need to go into you know, the problems that you're trying to solve. But at the end of the day, at this point, you, you should, especially after you finish this course, you should have an absolute great fundamental understanding of the builder-centric types of things. So ultimately, the aim of this course is to be more programmer-centric, to take into account that if you're going to learn the underlying system, work at that really low level, as low down as we can get, right above the silicon level, there's no way you can't be a more efficient programmer because you're going to be working at that, that tedious level of detail that higher level languages never make you think about. And as I said, subconsciously, you will start incorporating those ideas into your higher level programming. So that's a great I say that's a great thing to think about as you're progressing through this course. So, you know, as a corollary to that, you will be writing programs that are more reliable and more efficient, like and, and up front without having to work your way backwards and fix it up later on. You, you will think more logically, you'll be able to think at a lower level so that each line of your programming code is, is efficient and only does what it needs to do, doesn't do anything more than it needs to do to get the job done. 
And then, of course, point three here, assembly language. You're never going to see this anywhere else unless you decide to go into anything more with assembly language. So uh, we're going to be covering a lot of mathematics when it comes to converting numbers from one, uh, uh, one data type to another. How do I convert the number you know, 3.14? How did I convert that into its binary representation? We will cover things like that. But mainly, it comes down to the logic of solving problems at as low level as we possibly can get, at least with a computer programming language. So our final slide, as you can see, the, the course that you're taking now, Microprocessor Assembly Language, has an equivalent over at Carnegie Mellon University, which is Foundation of Computer Systems. And also what you can see from this is this course is a hub for pretty much every other field that you could progress down in computer science. So over here on the left hand side are the more computer science oriented things, databases, networking, operating systems, compilers, distributed systems, so forth and so on. These kind of roles you know, are what we see as computer scientists. But more on the computer engineering side of things is where, you know, embedded systems. You will absolutely be using assembly language if you went down into that sort of embedded systems world. Embedded systems, you know, pretty much, you know, someone's got to program your microwave. Someone has to program your refrigerator. And obviously we're not putting a $300 processor into those things. We're using very limited memory, you know, so we have to use assembly language to make that work. As you see, assembly language is the hub between a, the interaction between a human programming a computer to do the things that we want it to do and the computer taking that programming language of any any form breaking it down into its smallest components and making it actually work on these you know pieces of silicon that we're working with so that pretty much covers today's this week's lecture activity so you're going to have questions over the course of this term every single student minus three or four of them over the last three or four years has had issues with something or other and have asked questions so you know you're gonna need to get a hold of me or get a hold of your fellow students one way or another right so like the best way to get a hold of me email me I'll get back to you as quick as I can make sure you tell me who you are where you're coming from which course you're in maybe send me a file if you want me to look at something to help you out I need specific questions I'm not gonna look over something that you know the email just comes in and says does this look good and I'm like I'm not gonna take that level of effort you need to go like oh I don't understand how to do a specific part so you can email me uh, you can look through blackboard try to find my office hours I'm on campus at least six or seven hours a week um, you know some of you might not be feasible but it is something you know if you want to see me in person and talk to me about things in that regard as well so you also have your fellow students you know if you, most of you are probably taking other courses online or you're either in in the classroom somewhere or another you can get a hold of each other and figure out how to work things out please see the uh, other lectures about how i expect you guys to act when you're working on homework and things together so the one absolutely major thing, the final bullet point here, is that you don't just sit around and you don't have your questions answered. You know, these things are going to snowball really quickly, and I want to make absolute certain, especially in this online environment, that everybody is on the same page, ready to move forward with the new material. So that's it for this lecture. Thank you, everybody. We'll see you next time.